So it seems that we are ready to start quite on time, so I'm, I'm very happy. So let me just do some housekeeping before that you are starting. So this section is uh, a section with three papers, and uh, each of these papers is having a discussion. So you know, we have uh, uh, pretty much two hours where we can, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, allocate 40 minutes for each paper. So the way on which I think will be the optimal way to allocate the time is that the presenter will use 20 minutes, then the discussion another 10, and then we are having an open question for another 20 minutes. But I'm leaving to the presenter the freedom to decide if they want to present in 30 minutes and not get after the discussion any other <laughs> question, pretty much. So I will be strict with the time. And also tell us if you want uh, to get questions, mostly clarification question during your presentation. And uh, I will suggest that then we are having all the other questions after the discussant have present, has uh, presented this question, OK? It's all fine for everybody. So we are starting with the first paper that is on climate stress testing. And uh, He Yoon Jung is presenting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to present my paper, Climate Stress Testing, which is joint work with Rob Engel and Dick Berner from NYU Stern. And I'm at the New York Fed, so the disclaimer applies. So understanding the impact of climate change on financial stability is a very important question for researchers, banks, and regulators alike. And how could climate-related shocks impose systemic risk on financial sector if banks systemically suffer huge losses after a sharp increase in either transition risk or physical risk, then climate change can affect financial stability. And one of the key questions here is about quantification. So how much systemic risk does climate change impose on financial system? That's the research question of this paper. So before I jump into the details, let me briefly discuss some of the common climate stress testing challenges and how we try to address them. So first of all, analysis based on the past climate events may not effectively capture the changes in the perception of risk. And this is because market expectations can change without a direct experience of climate change events. And also, asset prices today can reflect the changes in future climate risk, even if the damages are decades away. So we use a market-based methodology, which allows us to fully incorporate the changes in market expectations. And second, the climate risk itself changes over time, and how firms, banks, and markets respond to the perceived risk also changes over time. So to this end, we estimate a dynamic model which allows volatilities and correlations to be time varying. So we are not assuming that banks' portfolio holdings are constant over time or leverage is going to be constant over time. And lastly, data gaps and timeliness have been um, pointed as common challenges. And our methodology only requires publicly available information and we estimate our model on a daily basis, so we hope that our measure could be a useful and timely measure. So in this paper, we develop a climate stress testing methodology to test the resilience of financial institutions to climate-related risks. And our methodology is market-based, and it involves three steps. So the first step is to measure the climate risk factor, and then the next step is to estimate each bank's climate beta, and it's, the, it's capturing the, each, each bank's climate risk exposure to the factor that we measured in the first step. And once we have bank's climate beta measures, then we can compute systemic climate risk, which we call C-risk. And the C-risk is defined as the expected capital shortfall of banks in a climate stress scenario. And we apply this methodology to large global banks to understand their climate-related risk exposures. So here are the key findings. First of all, we find that the climate beta and C risk went up substantially during 2020. 
In terms of the magnitude, the aggregate C risk of the top four U.S. banks went up by $425 billion during 2020. And this corresponds to about 47% of their market cap. So this is a substantial rise in the C risk. And we were wondering what was the primary driver of the increase. So in the second finding, we decomposed the increase in C-risk during 2020 into three components. The first one is from the equity deterioration, and then the debt deterioration, and then increase in the climate betas. And we find that the substantial rise during 2020 was primarily due to the equity deterioration, as well as the rise in climate betas. Looking at this result, we were wondering if banks were already under stress in 2020 without any climate stress because the equity deterioration was one of the primary components. So we looked at the marginal C-risk, which is the difference between the C-risk and non-stress C-risk, where the non-stress C-risk is simply the capital shortfall of banks under zero climate stress scenario. So this is after taking out the market effect. And in third finding, we find that the marginal aggregate, C, aggregate marginal C risk of the top four U.S. banks was about $260 billion. So this suggests that the effect of climate stress could be substantial. And lastly, we find that both exposure to the brown loans and the risk of the brown loans explain the variations in the climate beta, which corroborates the economic validity of our measure. So now let me explain each step in detail. So the first step is to construct a climate risk factor. And there can be many ways to do it. And here we use a market-based measure. We use stranded asset portfolio return as a measure of transition risk. The idea behind this is that as economies move into less carbon intensive environment, the fossil fuels are likely become stranded assets. So this portfolio is constructed by Litterman, and the World Wildlife Fund, where he chairs committee, is taking a short position in this portfolio to get a climate hedge. Specifically, it's composed of 30% long position in energy ETF, 70% long position in coal ETF, and then it's normalized by S&P 500 index. And what you see here is the six-month return on this portfolio from 2000 to 2021. And since 2011, it has mostly been falling. And we interpret this underperformance of the stranded asset portfolio as a rise in transition risk. And um, in later analysis, we have constructed other risk factors as well, but this one, we are using it as a base case. And once we have the climate risk factor, then we can estimate each bank's climate beta. And the climate beta captures the bank's stock return sensitivity to the climate risk factor that we measured in the first step. And we model bank stock return with two factors. The first factor is market factor, and the second factor is climate risk factor from the first set. And we call this loading on the second factor the climate beta. And we estimate this model dynamically and on a daily basis. So in general, we expect climate beta to be positive for large global banks because they have large exposure to brown loans. And here are the climate beta estimates of the top 10 US banks. First of all, you can see that climate betas move around, which suggests that it's very important to estimate this dynamically. And in time series, you can see that the climate beta started off from zero, and then it fell into slightly negative territory here in the early financial crisis. And then they were on the rise, and there was a substantial increase in climate beta around 2020. And the peak was in November 2020. And we repeated this exercise for other countries sorry, including the UK, Canada, Japan, and France. And we find that this increase, sharp increase in climate beta during 2020 was common across countries, across banks. 
And once we have the climate beta estimates, then we can compute C risk. And here we follow the S risk methodology. So the C risk is defined as the expected capital shortfall conditional on climate stress. And it's a function of D, which is the book value of debt of the bank. W is the market cap of the bank. And then long run marginal expected shortfall, which is the expected equity loss conditional on the climate stress. And K here is the prudential level of equity relative to assets. And we set it as 8% and 5.5% for European banks to account for accounting differences. And theta, which goes into here, is the climate stress level. And we calibrate it to 50%. And this is because negative 50% is the 1% quantile of the six month return on the stranded asset portfolio. This can be considered as an extreme scenario. So just to recap, the climate stress scenario that we are considering is the 50% decline in the stranded asset portfolio over the six month time period. And the climate data from the second step goes into this term. And here are the C risks of the top 10 US banks. The positive numbers mean that there was an expected capital shortfall and the negative numbers can be interpreted as excess reserves. And the climate, the C risk is not a sole function of climate beta. So a bank with high climate beta in the earlier plots may have low C risk if the bank is sufficiently capitalized. And you can see that there are three peaks. The first two peaks are associated with the financial crisis and the European financial crisis. And then there is another peak here, and you can see that there was a substantial rise in C-risk in 2020. And it's not surprising to see that the C-risks were high during the crisis, and this is because when banks are undercapitalized, they are vulnerable to market risks as well as climate risks. However, I will show you in a few slides, I will show you a key difference between these two peaks and the latest one by looking at the marginal C risk after taking out the undercapitalization of the banks at the point in time. We again, we did the same exercise for other countries and we find that this substantial rise in C risk was common across countries. And then we decompose the C-risk into three components. The first component is coming from the debt deterioration. The second component is coming from the equity deterioration. And the last component is capturing the effect of rise in climate beta. And here is the decomposition table for the US banks. This column, the first column is the C-risk at the end of 2019. Second column is at the end of 2020. The third column is the change during the 2020. And if I add up the four numbers here for the top four US banks, they add up to $425 billion, which is substantial. They're about 40%, 47% of their market cap. And the next three columns are the decomposition. And you can see that the, these two, the equity deterioration and the rise in climate beta were the primary components. And because the equity deterioration being one of the primary factors could mean that banks were already under stress in 2020 without any climate stress. So we looked at the marginal C risk. So the marginal C risk is the difference between the C risk and non-stress C risk. And what I'm plotting here is the difference between the two of the top 10 US banks. And you can see that the gap was pretty much very low during the financial crisis. However, the gap opened up in 2019, 2019, and they remained high until 2021, where the graph ends. And if I add up the top four US banks marginal C risks, they add up to $260 billion. So this suggests that the effect of climate stress can be substantial. Lastly, we looked at the climate beta, the relationship between the climate beta and the brown loan exposure as well as the brown loan risk. So this one is about the brown loan exposure. What you see here is the bin scatter plot of climate beta on the y-axis and the brown loan share on the x-axis. 
and we define brown loan as brown loan share as the share of loans that were made to borrowers in the top 30 industries by carbon emissions. And this is based on the Y14 data, which has granular information on the loan portfolio holdings of large banks. We have 21 listed U.S. banks here over this time period. And you can see that the relationship is positive. The banks with higher loan exposure to industries with high emissions have higher climate betas. We tested this idea formally by running a regression. We regressed quarterly climate beta on the brown loan share. And you can see that after, even after including the bank controls and bank fixed effects and ear fixed effects, you see that the coefficients are positive and significant across specifications. And lastly, this is about the risk of brown loans. We looked at the average probability of default of brown industries in red line and all other industries in blue line. And you can see that during the 2020, um, the first two quarters, of course, all industries' PD went up. But you can see that the brown industries' average PD went up much more sharply. And the PD numbers are coming from banks' internal assessments, and they're reported as part of the Dodd-Frank stress test requirements. And we were thinking that maybe the differential between these two lines can help explain the dramatic increase in the climate beta across the banks. So we regressed the quarterly climate beta on the PD differential, the difference between these two lines, and we also include the brown loan share as the right-hand side variable. And as expected, the PD differential ex explaining the time series variation in climate beta. And interestingly, the brown loan share is still an important coefficient across the specification. So this suggests that both exposure to the brown loan and the risk of the brown loans help explain the climate beta variations. And we also considered some interesting extensions. The first line is about compound risk. So the question here is, what if a climate stress comes with a market stress? Then by calibrating the stress levels, um, we can compute a S and C risk. And another line of extension that we consider is about stylized versions of transition scenarios. So we constructed different factors for instance, um, emission-based factor, and we think that could be associated with a stylized version of carbon tax. We also considered other scenarios as well. And to conclude, uh, we developed a climate stress testing methodology, and we introduced a measure called C-Risk, and we hope that this could be a complement, useful complement to other stress testing methodologies, as well as scenario analysis. Thank you. Thank you very much. This Carson is Clara. Good. Thank you also for Thank you. your <laughs> time. Very good. So Sara Gonzalez from Banco de España. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for inviting me to discuss this paper, Climate Stress Testing. As you have seen, this is a very interesting paper, and I enjoyed uh, reading it. I, 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 I am working at Banco de España on sustainable finance issues, and, and I, I can say that this area has increased uh, during the last years, and this paper contributes uh, to this area of research. I'm not going to, to repeat uh, the whole uh, the <laughs> uh, uh, messages, but just I wanted to, to remark uh, that this paper presents a novel approach um, uh, and, and the authors develop a market-based climate stress testing methodology. I think that this is uh, one of the main points of the, of the paper. Uh, of, uh, she has explained uh, the objective is to show that uh, financial institutions will be exposed to climate change. Uh, we know uh, that this called transition risk. 
and this can, uh, dire uh, can uh, result into um, the stranded assets. The methodology addresses the challenge of the time varying nature of climate risk uh, uh, by estimating the model dynamically. I think that this is a very good point of the, of the paper uh, because when you uh, are developing this uh, type of methodologies, the time varying nature of the model it's a complicated issue, so this is a very good point of the paper. And then you propose a measure called C risk. You have these three steps. First, to measure the climate risk factor with a market-based measure in order to, to obtain a proxy for the stranded asset portfolio. The second step, you estimate time varying uh, climate betas of finance institutions. And then the third step, to compute the C risk. Uh, this procedure is applied uh, to the main or the large global banks in the US, UK, Canada, Japan, and, and France. And I'm going to comment uh, regarding the differences between uh, uh, geographical areas, but I think that it, this is important. And uh, you focus on, uh, then you focus the analysis uh, in 2020, that I think that this is a very particular year. Uh, it is true that it is an stress <laughs> year, <laughs> but uh, maybe you could extend the, the methodology to other point in time. Um, and you have uh, three specific sections that they are uh, new in the last uh, version that you sent me. And I think that some of my previous comments uh, were answered in these specific sections. Um, first, the climate, the comparison between the climate beta and loan portfolio banks. I think that. I, this is a market-based methodology, so uh, it will be good uh, to compare with uh, the, the granular data you have done for, for US, but I'm going to mention uh, later. Uh, some robustness check, for example, using close alternative climate factors. I think that this will be uh, useful and some extensions that you use, I think that they are very, very good. So this is a very timely paper, relevant material research, new methodology for the analysis of the implications of transition risk, and I'm going to, to my specific comments. Um, regarding the market-based climate distress uh, methodology, when I read the paper, I was uh, uh, wondering if the final analysis through C-risk is capturing market risk and credit risk, the transmission of credit risk to market risk, or only market risk. And I think that this could be explained more in the, in the paper, or maybe to clarify what are you uh, identifying uh, with your methodology. And regarding the first step, the climate risk factor is a function of uh, stranded asset portfolio returns, but it is a proxy. And, and I was wondering why 0 0.3 and 0 0.7 I don't know if you have other sensitivity analysis for these uh, parameters, other measures. You have in this new version an alternative, but uh, uh, I, I don't know if, if you can refine or maybe just check uh, if you can use it uh, with other measures. And, and I was curious if this measure can be applied for, to all banks, regardless of the country. I don't know. For me, it was strange, but. Uh, I don't know if it, 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 you can use a specific indexes for, for each country, maybe, or sectoral indexes for each country. The second comment, you mentioned that many central banks have started uh, to include uh, climate uh, stress scenarios, uh, developing stress test methodologies. And your methodology is different from the climate stress test exercises, top down and bottom up, that central banks usually are uh, putting in place. They use uh, letter, well, they use granular data. I think that this is the main difference. And they use a specific climate change scenarios. I think that you could uh, include a brief description with the differences between your methodology and the, and the um, stress test exercises done by central banks. I, I mean, top down, macro potential stress test, or bottom up, micro potential uh, stress test. And uh, I am going to send you the presentation, so you will have all of these references, but I have included some references uh, for Europe. You have uh, the European System Risk Board that uh, have uh, uh, done uh, this uh, compilation of which central banks uh, perform uh, bottom-up or top-down. Or, I mean, the, the main difference is that they use uh, granular data, 
Uh, of course, Banco de España has uh, developed the climate stress test for transition risk, and, and in our case, we use uh, data from the Central Credit Register and the European Central Bank. But my question is that, okay, you have this market base uh, compared with uh, um, specific data from banks, but you have done for US, so you have now in this new version, you have partially this, but I think that you could include a brief description just with the differences from your methodology and the, and the because you mentioned in the introduction that, that central banks are performing this, this type of central bank, so maybe you could add that the difference is uh, the methodology. You use 2020 as a main year of reference. Uh, as I have said, this is a stress year, but maybe you could um, uh, do a more detailed analysis pre and post 2020. Uh, the same considering before and after Paris Agreement. In the last version you have in the annex uh, some analysis, but I think that you can explode, uh, explore more the, the different uh, behavior between um, uh, different uh, point in time. And my main group of comments uh, is related to geographical analysis. This version is more focused on US uh, and includes a specific section comparing with banking data. This is a good exercise. Perhaps you could uh, explain more uh, the, the possible uh, motivations uh, behind the behavior of investors. And, and you can find now some papers that find that changes in the U.S. administration led to changes in regulation and therefore evaluation of transition risk by investors. So I think that this is a very important uh, issue in the case of, of U.S. No? For example, Ramelli find that investors reacted to the election of Donald Trump regarding carbon intensive firms. So maybe the variations in time can be associated with these changes in administration or regulation. And uh, regarding the analysis uh, of banks uh, of, from other uh, geographical areas, you have applied to Canada, Japan, and France. I think that differences between countries would require deeper analysis. It is true that you focus on US, but maybe you could do even in an extension or, or a <laughs> second paper uh, with um, if, uh, looking for the differences between US and other areas. Uh, Perhaps there are different characteristics of the banking sector between, I'm thinking, US and Europe, and even regulation. Uh, in the case of, of Europe, you have uh, only France, and maybe you could extend the sample of European banks, because in Europe, the European Commission uh, has been working a lot since 2018, um, and all of these development, uh, developments have uh, uh, led to new regulations. And even, uh, let me show you a recent uh, work uh, that uh, Ricardo Jimen and me um, have run. This is for non-financial companies, but we construct a green minus polluter factor, and we show that the differences between US and Europe are relevant, and uh, in stock markets, investors value different, um, the, the different um, geographical areas and even the different point in time, and this green factor is very relevant, so maybe this, uh, just to, to support that uh, you could explore uh, the differences between geographical areas and looking for uh, perhaps differences in re regulation or differences in uh, the banking sector. And just the final comments, if you focus on Europe, uh, you can find uh, some information regarding the market risk channel in this document uh, from the ECB. Uh, they analyze the impact of market risk, um, that it is limited comparing with credit risk channel, and this could help you to clarify the market risk versus credit risk. Uh, in this uh, document, the European Systemic Risk Board uh, that published in July follows uh, your methodology, uh, so you could compare with uh, their results. Uh, they use a 40 listed uh, Euro area banks. They use another uh, climate factor, the Bloomberg Energy Sub Index Total Return. So maybe you can even use this and then compare uh, the results. Um, and just the last, the very last comment. Um, this is maybe a potential robustness check or maybe a variable that could explain some differences. And is that you could analyze differences by business type. Uh, because 
For example, the ECB uh, finds that the most emitting sector tend to be dominated by large companies, and at the same time, they are more likely to enter into relationships with larger banks. And I was wondering if the differences between type of bank, universal bank, investment bank, uh, that, uh, as you know, in, in US and Europe, for example, there are differences uh, in the composition in the banking sector, maybe could explain some of, of the differences that you find. Um, and OK, congratulations. This is a very interesting paper. Uh, paper. I hope uh, that these comments could uh, help you to to just to, to extend or to 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 get um, a nice paper. And, and, and thank you very much. Very good. So I'm going to collect some other questions, if any. Otherwise, I will. OK. I mean, um, One minute. I'm doing this beautiful role. Um, you showed us this rise in the climate beta in 2020. I was just wondering what your interpretation is, what is behind that, and whether you can exclude you know, like other potential alternatives. Of course, it was the year of the pandemic, and technology stocks uh, went crazy. So, um, But I'm sure you have a take on that. Thanks. Another question? Um, so it's, it's related, the question is related to the previous one. I think, uh, you know, when I see high frequency fluctuations, I think they could be drive, driven by a lot of uh, transitory things, you know, like oil, oil prices that first comes to mind when I see the time series. But um, when I think of climate risks, I think it's something that's a lower frequency. So I was wondering if, you know, you can extend the paper by looking specific, it, it's really a question of interpretation, right? It's not you know, you, you could use your daily data to extract different frequency components of each of your time series, the climate risk and the, 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 the climate beta and the, the C risk and the marginal C risk, all of them could be decomposed into high and low frequency components. And I think the low frequency component would be the one that is more informative of the climate risk as we understand it. So I think I can start to answer. Yeah, um, thank you, Clara, so much for your um, thoughtful comments. They are going to be extremely helpful. Um, just to respond to your, respond to your comments, I, I like all of your comments um, about the market risk versus credit risk. It's, we found it quite challenging to disentangle, but one way could be that um, Y14 has um, the bank's security holdings as well as the loan holdings. We've only looked at the uh, loan holdings, but it would be interesting to see the security holdings as well. Um, and where are the 0.3 versus 0.7 in this trended asset portfolio is coming from? Um, we didn't come up with this. Um, it's something that um, Lederman is using in his uh, fund. Uh, so we thought it's a natural um, candidate to use, but we can definitely do the robustness test to um, do the sensitivity analysis. And um, the comparison with central bank stress test results, that's actually coming as a new paper um, <laughs> with collaboration with um, central banks. Um, and then um, the exploiting the geographic variations, um, we agree that it's, it, it will be very interesting. We found that um, the climate betas in the UK are in general higher than the US, and that's maybe um, coming from the it's, it's very relevant to your comment on the green minus polluter is different across regions, so that's going to be very um, useful. We are going to try to use them. And um, yes, 2020 is very special. Um, the idea that we have in mind is that in 2020, there was a demand shock to the oil and gas, the energy. Um, so we think um, when economies become greener, that's going to happen, there's going to be a demand um, shock to the energy. So that's why we thought 2020 is actually a useful um, channel. I mean, the useful um, yeah, um, time to think about. But we agree that um, we can also try looking at other events like Paris Agreement and Trump election. Um, and the bank business models, that's also interesting. I like that idea. We'll think about it. And um, um, to respond to the questions, the climate the rise in climate beta um, 
the time series variation is mainly, we think, coming from the, um, the credit risk. So that's what I showed you, um, the average probability of default of the brown industries versus other industries. So of course, during 2020, all industries suffered, but the brown, and brown industries PD went up much more sharply. So we think the risk of brown loans, that's um, the the driver behind the very sharp increase in climate beta during 2020. And interestingly, even after the Ukrainian war and the rise in oil prices, we find that the climate betas are still positive. It didn't come back to the previous level. So that's something that's um, interesting. And um, lastly, the, considering different frequency components, I really like your idea. Um, then we can think about long-term versus short-term scenarios, which will be very helpful. Um, we will definitely think about that. Thank you very much for your questions. Many thanks to the organizers for the invitation. Um, this paper is close to being published, but it's only the second time we've presented, uh, which is uh, kind of funny. I, I think I should be presenting more, indeed. Uh, it's a uh, um, joint work with my uh, friend, colleague, co-author, and boss of all things, uh, Luke Lavan, and the usual disclaimer applies. Now, the motivation for the paper, I guess, is kind of clear. We are living through a uh, climate crisis, uh, things are not just bad for our children, but if you look at the biblical proportions of this year's drought in Europe, uh, it's starting to bite our generation as well. So as a friend of mine said, if climate change is a hoax, uh, then the, the budget for the special effects is insane. So we've decided to finally do something about it, uh, and because we started late, now we have to do a lot in a very short time. So the Glasgow Agreement, which was signed last year, uh, calls for something like an 8.5% annual reduction in carbon emissions each year all the way until 2030, which is kind of ridiculous if you think about it. it it's impossible, and I, I'm, I'm not sure that committing to impossible goals is a, is a good idea, but this is where we stand. This is how much we need to do. Uh, and even if we achieve half of that or a quarter of that, um, there are two ways to do it. Uh, one is holding the technology constant to kind of reduce our um, consumption of goods and services which are uh, climate unfriendly. So, you know, purchase fewer same day Amazon deliveries, fly less, that kind of stuff. The other is um, holding our habits constant to change the technology. And make sure that you know planes have zero carbon engines and ships have zero carbon engines and there are viable alternatives to cement and so on and so forth. Um, and my personal prior is that habits die very very slowly, so technology is the only hope. Uh, but whichever path we choose, um, we need to be incentivized <laughs> and. A carbon tax has been singled out by economists as one of the primary tools in stimulating both a change in, in economic choices and a greening of the technology that we have. The bad news is that as of the end of 2021, very few countries in the world have a carbon tax, something like 25. Uh, and even the European Union, which is a champion in, in terms of climate policy, uh, only 11 countries have a, have a carbon tax. Now, it seems like the whole of the EU is covered by something here on this chart, which is because I'm uh, mixing here carbon taxes and an ETS. Uh, but there are plenty of countries in Europe which only have an ETS. Um, there are those that have an ETS and a carbon tax, and there are a few that only have a carbon tax. Ukraine, by the way, well done, has a carbon tax. Nevertheless, uh, even the countries that have a carbon tax, in none of those, carbon tax is at levels recommended by economists. It's too low. It's almost symbolic. That's one. And the second problem is that uh, if only some countries have a carbon tax and others don't, this creates the scope for carbon tax arbitrage, or as someone call it, uh, a waterbed effect. Right? You lie on one side of the bed and the water goes to the other side of the bed, but it's the same amount of water. Um, so the risk is there that you impose a carbon tax in one country and 
banks move their fossil lending to other jurisdictions around the globe. And that is kind of suspicion is confirmed by the fact that since the Paris Agreement was signed, according to various reports, almost $4 trillion worth in fossil lending has been distributed by global banks. Okay, so <clears throat> in this paper we thought let's, you know, see if this suspicion uh, has some grounds in the date. So we look at the effect of instituting a carbon tax in a particular country on fossil lending by banks in that country. And most importantly, we distinguish between whether this fossil lending takes place domestically or abroad. And we look at syndicated loans because these data are global, because they are easy to obtain, and because they cover most of the, of the loans abroad by large banks and to large companies. And we define fossil lending a little bit more broadly, I think, than what was done in the previous paper. So we look at loans to gas, oil, and coal companies, which are really the ones which are extracting uh, fossil fuel from the ground. And as we know from the Paris Agreement, the way to solve the climate crisis is to keep uh, this fossil fuel in the ground. Um, and so what we find is that as a result of imposing a carbon tax in a country, the banks in this country increase the share of foreign fossil lending and decrease the share of domestic foreign fossil lending. Um, so that's kind of an immediate confirmation of this concern about carbon tax arbitrage that people have. It's not the case for non-fossil lending, so it's not part of some sort of, you know, you're increasing regulation in a country and domestic lending overall, broadly speaking, goes down. No, it's just fossil lending that goes down. Um, the effect is similar when we look at introduce, introducing an ETS instead of a carbon tax, which kind of makes sense because uh, um, an emissions trading system, in fact, can, can price carbon better than a carbon tax. So right now, the price uh, is around 100 euro per ton of carbon uh, on the European ETS, which is uh, more than what economists call optimal. Uh, and finally, we look at uh, sort of the uh, channels and the mechanisms, why this is taking place. And we find that on the bank side, this is related to um, specialization. So banks that are used to lending to fossil companies continue doing so. Now they just do it abroad. Uh, the companies that get those loans are mostly private and repeat borrowers. So that tells you something about risk information and uh, the value of bank firm relationships. And finally, the countries to which this fossil lending is, is flowing are countries with weak environmental rules and uh, less comprehensive bank supervision. So that again goes into the direction of this idea of, of arbitrage. Um, if you want to remember one chart from the paper, that's it. So on the left side I have uh, plotted the point estimates of domestic fossil lending and on the right side of foreign fossil lending and the red line is the year in which a carbon tax was introduced. And as you can see, there is no pre-trend and immediately after a carbon tax is introduced, domestic for fossil lending declines, foreign fossil lending increases. Now, the decline in fossil lending is rather small, it's about 1%. The increase in foreign fossil lending is rather big, it's more than 6%. But when you take into account that 92.5% of all loans, of all fossil loans, are domestic, in the aggregate, this is associated with a reduction in overall fossil lending, but it's rather small. It's to the magnitude of 0.4%. So we are kind of in a waterbed scenario here. Um, there is a literature on the effects of cross-border lending, on the design and effects of a carbon tax, and on how climate change and financial markets uh, interact, and also on pollution heavens. So that literature has shown that basically firms are mobile. Uh, they like to choose the country where, where they're punished the least by regulators. So the way we tie up all these literatures is by, by saying, you know, carbon tax is also a determinant of cross-border lending, and it complements pollution heavens. It's not just firms that are moving around, it's banks that are moving around there. Uh, that, that are readjusting their cross-border portfolios. In terms of data, uh, the data on when a carbon tax is introduced and when a country joins the ETS is public. Uh, the data on bank lending comes from DealScan. Like I said, we look at syndicated loans uh, and we look at whether a loan is to a fossil company or not, how large it is, what's the maturity 
uh, and what is the fossil exposure of the bank that gives this loan. Um, now, small detail, everyone who's worked with DealScan knows sometimes you know the shares with which each bank is participating in a syndicate. Most of the time you don't. So we impute the shares in the cases where we don't, as others do in the literature. Then we get data from bank scope and bank characteristics. We know the capitalization and the profitability of the banks. Then from CompuStat, we get data on firm characteristics, uh, their growth, debt, profitability. Uh, then from the EBRD and the IMF, we get data on uh, host country characteristics, so basically how stringent climate regulation is in the host country and how stringent bank supervision is. And after putting all these data together, all of which are uh, non-confidential, right? Some of them you have to pay for, but anyone can reproduce our results. We get a final data set of 21,000 plus banks, almost 100,000 firms, and uh, more than 2 million uh, bank loan firm tranche observations. So if you know, a syndicated loan is given to a company and 18 banks participate, we split the loan in 18 tranches. That's why we have so many observations. And here is the main result of the paper. With that data in line, uh, we can run a regression where the dependent variable is a dummy equal to one if uh, a, a loan tranche from a bank domiciled in a country to a firm domiciled in any country at time t is a fossil loan, meaning the firm that receives the loan is in the fossil industry, coal, oil, or gas company. And that is regressed on uh, a dummy of whether the loan is to a foreign company, an interaction of that with whether there is a carbon tax imposed in the domestic country at this point or not, and a bunch of uh, dummy interactions and fixed effects. In particular, you need bank fixed effects because any panel variation can be driven by um, time invariant differences across banks. And we also include host country year dummy interactions and home country year dummy interactions to account for all kinds of regulatory and business trends which are common to banks and firms within a country. And running this regression gives us the following table, the main table in the paper. Uh, as you can see, we progressively saturate the regression with uh, dummies and, and, and fixed effects. Uh, but the coefficient is remarkably stable, and so in column three, which is the preferred specification with all the fixed effects and dummies, um, the interpretation of that is that imposing a carbon tax results in about 7% increase in foreign fossil lending, or in the share, the probability that a foreign loan will be given to a fossil company, let's put it that way. Um, so that's basically the, the, the result of the paper. The share of foreign fossil lending increases, the share of domestic fossil lending declines. Now, we run two very important regressions. Uh, first is related to the pre-trend. Is this really the result of the carbon tax, or were banks already adjusting their behavior before and a carbon tax kind of followed? Uh, well, no. Here in column one, we include a pre-trend, and as you can see, before the introduction of a carbon tax, actually domestic fossil lending was increasing, and that trend was broken once a carbon tax was introduced. The second concern is maybe this is not about fossil lending, maybe this is just about overall lending, maybe a carbon tax is a part of a broader review of the regulatory framework of a country, and then countries reduce all kinds of domestic lending, not just fossil. Well, we look at non-fossil lending here, and we have more of those, but these are kind of the most obvious candidates, so wholesale and retail industry and clean manufacturing. These are all manufacturing companies excluding metallurgy and cement. So these are sectors which are not affected by a carbon tax in any way. And as you can see, uh, there is no change in the geography of, of lending to those sectors after a carbon tax is introduced. So this really should be about the price of carbon and how that affects the incentives of banks to lend to carbon intensive companies. Now then we have an embarrassingly long number of robustness tests. Um, I don't have the tables here, but, but I'll mention a few. So first of all, firm fixed effects. We take the same firm and the same bank lending to it before and after a carbon tax is introduced. And we see that even in this pair, uh, um, the probability of, of, of giving a fossil loan after the carbon tax goes down. Uh, we cluster in alternative ways. We define fossil lending not just as gas, oil, and coal, but also we include mining 
we include metallurgy and we include cement. And the effect is not just there, but it's even stronger in some cases. We only look at lead banks because there are papers that consider only the lead bank in a syndicate the important one. Results stay the same. We drop the largest countries in terms of loans. We look at shorter windows around the carbon tax event, and we account for an ETS as well. Uh, the final test was suggested by a referee, and it's fantastic. Uh, so in, in Europe, there is an ETS, an, an emissions trading system, but it doesn't cover all sectors. It actually, uh, so it covers utilities and, and cement and metallurgy, for example, but it doesn't cover transportation and agriculture, which are very carbon intensive sectors as well. So in Europe, you have an excellent additional uh, m margin where you can test. You have an introduction of the ETS, you have carbon intensive sectors, but not all of them are covered by the ETS. And what we show in the paper is that only the sectors which are covered by the ETS, the banks respond by lending less to those, and they don't respond by lending less to sectors which are not covered by the ETS once the ETS is introduced. So the interpretation here is that you need to change the price of carbon to get a action on the, on the bank lending margin. Okay, so... It's not just uh, the probability of giving a fossil loan, it's also the loan characteristics that change. So banks giving a fossil loan abroad now uh, lend larger amounts at shorter maturities. It's kind of an interesting trade-off between, between size and, and, and duration. So this is, in, in one way it's risk-taking, in the other it's, it's, it's less, less of that. Um, mechanisms, so what kind of, why? Why are banks reacting like this? Is it because as a result of the carbon tax, they also become... Uh, so, so you're changing the price of carbon, obviously. That, that's what's happening. Uh, but on the, on the supply side, why is it that the bank, banks react? Um, maybe it's you know, the low capital banks that are now hit by additional regulation and they change their behavior. Or the low profit banks. Well, it's not that. It's only the banks that are specializing in fossil lending. So that's column one. The larger your exposure to the fossil market or fossil companies before the carbon tax is introduced, the more likely you are to engage in this type of behavior, which is you reduce lending at home, increase it abroad. So these are the banks that don't want to leave you know, uh, that market. They are, they've invested too much in it. So they're just moving to greener pastures or browner pastures, actually, in this, in this case. Uh, how about firms? Which kind of firms benefit from this? Well. It's repeat borrowers, column five. So, you know, that's the, there is a value about bank firm relationships and, and keeping those for a long time. And banks uh, don't drop you like that. So that, that, that is confirmed here. Um, columns two and three, it's low growth and low debt companies that benefit. So this is not really about banks engaging in more risk taking, it seems. But most importantly, column one, it's private firms and not public firms that are benefiting. And this tells us that it's a bit, the evidence is consistent with this idea of avoiding scrutiny. So banks are trying to fly under the radar here. They're going to companies that are less stringently monitored by markets and, and um, investors. Finally, what kind of countries is now the fossil lending flowing to? Well, it's countries that have less stringent green policy, environmental regulation, and less stringent bank supervision. So that's on the one hand some sort of a regulatory arbitrage. You, you know, there is a lot of publicity now. Everybody hates banks which are, which are lending to, to uh, companies that extract oil from pristine Alaskan uh, reserves. Uh, so you, know, you go to places where you are less likely to be bothered by the supervisor and where the country is shutting its eyes in terms, of, uh, in terms of tightening green policy. So that's kind of rather obvious, but it's good to know. Uh, and the second result is interesting because it means that even in the absence of stringent um, climate regulation in the host country, if you have tight and efficient bank supervision, that kind of helps in today's age, where everybody has become a politician in a way. Uh, everybody has, a, has an agenda, and the green agenda is, is on the table of every one of us. So, so having strict, stringent bank supervision actually helps and makes it less likely that this fossil lending will come to your country. 
Okay, so let me conclude. There is a literature on the design and efficiency of a carbon tax, but not really on linking it to cross-border finance. And what we do here is uh, look at how a carbon tax affects the geography of lending to fossil companies by banks affected by this carbon tax because they're domiciled in the country that is enacting it. And what we find is that uh, fossil lending in the country that imposes a carbon tax goes down, but the at the expense of an increase everywhere else. Uh, so it's not really everywhere else. It's mostly to countries with less stringent regulation, mostly to private companies and repeat borrowers. And the banks that are the most likely to, to react in that way are the ones for whom it is a business model lending to fossil companies. So this paper really has one policy implication, which is a carbon tax needs to be global. Otherwise, and we've known that in the sense that uh, foot low, foot loose firms or firms in foot loose industries have been, you know, adjusting their behavior for, for a long time. We know that. You impose, you, you make environmental regulations stringent in one country and then, you know, the company closes its factories there and opens them somewhere else. And from the point of view of the planet, nothing happens. Uh, so we've known that. But now we also know that uh, this carbon tax in one country can be arbitraged away by multinational banks because they would support this migration of footloose companies across the globe. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and thank I'm looking you. forward to my discussion. Thank you very much. So, you know, clearly we are very happy that, you know, the paper it has been already accepted, but clearly the discussant will have always something to say, so we are looking forward to see what Ifa is going to say. Um, great, you can hear me. So thank you, Alexander, for that wonderful presentation. I realized I've been here for both times that you presented it, so I'm going to take that as a mark of good luck for today. And thank you to the organizers of this conference for inviting me here to discuss this paper. Um, as I'm sure you've all come to realize, this is a super important topic for everyone globally. And this, there hasn't been so much research done on the effects of carbon taxes and um, bank cross-border lending. So this is really cutting edge and I think really vital to the literature that this is being explored. So just to give a brief summary, because Alexander has done such a good job, um, basically using syndicated loan data, the authors were able to identify changes in bank lending um, to fossil fuel companies, both domestically and at home, as I'm sure we've all come to expect by now that banks were decreasing their lending in the domestic markets and then increasing them in the foreign markets. What I found to be a really interesting result, actually, and a little bit hopeful, was there was an overall net decrease of fossil lending by about 0.4%. So although it's not huge, it is something. Um, and I thought the really interesting and key results that the authors were able to show was that banks specializing in this type of fossil fuel lending were significantly more likely to increase their lending to fossil fuel companies. And the borrowers that they tended to increase these loans to were, again, privately owned fossil fuel firms so that they could avoid public scrutiny. They gave preferences to existing borrowers. And these firms were typically low growth and low debt firms, which was actually quite surprising to me because these seemed to be less riskier firms. And finally, what was super interesting result as well was the host country that they typically were lending to or reallocating their lending to typically um, did not have more than 332 green laws, which for me actually seemed like quite a substantial amount of green laws. So that maybe indicated that even though some countries are implementing some type of green laws, maybe some sort of carbon taxes, there's still this reallocation happening. Um, so going on to my first comment, um, it is to do with the main model specification, as you can see here. Um, so the main coefficient of interest in this entire paper is going to be beta 2. I don't know if it, yes, beta 2. Um, it basically measures uh, the amount of cross-border lending that is happening once a carbon tax is introduced. Um, however, the authors, of course, have shown a very significant result here, and I have no doubt that this is happening, but I thought a really interesting way to further this type of literature would be instead of measuring carbon tax as a binary variable, either yes, zero, it's um, not happening, or one, it is happening, to be able to look at the different heterogeneities amongst carbon taxes. So I went on to the World Bank dashboard for carbon pricing. Um, just to look at the different kinds, whether or not there seem to be an average carbon tax out there, because there's about 22 countries with carbon taxes at the minute, 
and I looked at their initial rates and their current rates. And as you can see, the initial rate can substantially differ amongst countries. So Finland and Sweden, who are very close geographically and introduced a carbon tax essentially almost at the same time, had very, very different initial rates. So in this paper, we're measuring these two essentially as the same. Um, and also what I think is a very interesting factor and also difficult to implement into this type of model is usually when a carbon tax is introduced, governments often speak about the increase in rates yearly. So I would imagine that banks also have forward-looking expectations about how this will evolve within that specific country. Um, so one of the first things that popped into my mind when I was looking at this was, is there a threshold where carbon taxes do nothing? If you are only introducing it at $1.75 per uh, metric carbon ton, um, is that going to do anything? Will there be any effect? Will there be any decrease in domestic lending, any increase in um, foreign lending? And then I thought about it from the opposite perspective, because currently within this paper, we do have a net decrease of 0.4%. But if you're introducing an extremely aggressive and high carbon tax, is this going to overall increase carbon lending to these domestic firms if you have a net increase? So I think to be able to understand how carbon taxes are functioning throughout their levels is actually extremely important, especially for policymakers. Um, so I think this paper has done a really great job at identifying the effect, but I think a much, um, a lot further, it could, it could go a lot further with seeing the differences between the carbon taxes. And maybe that'll be your next paper. <laughs> um, but my second comment goes to the exogenous events, so the trends. So you're treating carbon taxes like an exogenous event. Um, and I went back again to these previous carbon taxes that I was looking at. I just started Googling around them to see how are these generally implemented. Um, and what I found is generally a year or two before they're being spoken about a lot by the governments and they um, are generally in newspapers. So I thought it was really, really interesting that you actually found that there is an increasing trend prior to the introduction of a carbon tax because I would imagine that the firms within those countries as well as the banks are also aware about two years prior to the fact that a carbon tax is going to be introduced. So I'm wondering, maybe is there some anticipatory uh, borrowing by these firms? Um, are banks really only caring when the introduction of the carbon tax is being made? Um, so I thought it would be really interesting if uh, you were able, also able to look at the announcement date of these carbon taxes, because I think that would be really important for policymakers to understand that if I announce this two years prior, maybe this is actually going to increase uh, lending to fossil fuel companies in the interim. Um, and then one of the... Um, so I, uh, yes, yeah, so I got through all my points there. And then my third comment that I have as well for you um, is there's also, this is obviously such new literature that's coming out, um, but there's also a similar paper to yours at the minute coming out. Um, there's No Planet B by Emanuela Benacasa, 2021. I'm sure you know. It is different. They do use similar syndicated loan data, but instead of carbon taxes, they are looking at um, general climate policy stringency within countries. Um, so they also find that cross-border lending is happening when you have high climate policy stringency. So it is validating your results. But what I think is really interesting with your paper is it is specifically looking at carbon taxes. And because that is so much on the table at the minute and what everyone is talking about, I think that it's really important that we have a specific paper out there looking at just carbon taxes. And again, like you showed in your um, actual paper, it takes a, this cross-border lending is also happening in countries with up to 132 of, of these climate policies. So I think this is a very interesting topic. Um, and then further questions that I have um, in this market is, or further, this is essentially a black box that has been opened in my brain and I just have so many more questions when I think about this. Specifically, what is happening to the interest rates in this domestic and foreign loan markets? Are banks pricing these um, as riskier firms now within regard to interest rates. Also, what is happening in the bond market? Are fossil fuel firms just sh supplementing this decrease in bank lending with issuing more bonds in a delayed manner? Um, and also just what is happening on the firm side? Are these fossil fuel companies actually investing more into becoming more green? 
Um, are banks increasing loan supply to green firms and decreasing them to brown firms after the introduction of carbon taxes? So just a lot more questions of mine that have been um, opened. And then one thing that I think that the paper could stress a little bit more, because I think this paper is so, so vital for policy um, makers, is what are the policy recommendations? It's very difficult to say, okay, we'll just introduce a global carbon tax, and it's probably pretty infeasible at this point, especially if countries are actually seeing this as a profitable way to attract um, new lending and um, capital into their fossil fuel companies. Um, it might actually discourage some companies from introducing carbon taxes. So if we cannot achieve a global carbon tax, what should we do? What are the alternatives? How do we mitigate this cross-border lending? Should we have some sort of bank regulation in place? Um, I think there could be a little bit more of a discussion there just because I think it's such an interesting topic. Um, and yes, I just want to say it was an extremely interesting paper. I know everyone always says, please read the paper, but I really think that everyone here should and um, enjoy reading it. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much. So I'm collecting some questions. Please, one minute, let me move. Okay. Uh, yeah, I thank you very much for the presentation. One yes. question is, uh, you, you spoke about the banking regulation in the receiving country, but what about the stringency of the banking regulation in the, in the giving country? Uh, is there any difference between, I don't know, SSM or non-SSM, for example, for Europe? Uh, and the other one is, um, have you looked at, I'm just thinking about geographic proximity as in mm. <laughs> kilometers. Is it to the neighbors? Is there a specific country that's benefiting? Is it, does, does the geography and the di distance, does it matter? Uh, Good. So then here. Thank you, Thank you very much for your presentations. I, I was just uh, wondering, um, in the case of the European banks, uh, with, the with the application of the taxonomy and the green asset ratio uh, that the European Banking Authority um, uh, has designed. I don't know the implication for those banks that uh, you find that increase their lending to these mm. uh, fossil fuel companies or brown sectors. I don't know what will happen if they have to, to restrict uh, just to, to comply with uh, taxonomy or green asset ratio uh, from the regulation. Thank you. All right. Um, so I, I just have a quantitative question. I don't know if you can speak to that. So you showed, I found very interesting, that supervisory policy stringency, in a sense, is like a substitute for the carbon tax. So is it really quantitatively? So I, I think from policy point of view, in the countries where carbon tax is like a no-go, would the central bank supervisor or supervisory policies be a way to discourage this kind of lending? I have also a question. You know, you show all the statistical significance of your result, but you know, what is really the economic impact? Uh, mostly for the last part uh, of your analysis, you know, uh, you know, it is coming to be significant, but how much at the end is really affecting? Uh, it is a significant proportion of their portfolio that they are doing this, or they are just statistically significant, but we are talking about peanuts, you know, 2% of their fossil fuel is moving on uh, uh, abroad. So how much is it indeed? Are they moving 50% of the portfolio or only two? Now you can answer. Okay. Many thanks. Uh, happy I stirred some interest. Um, so f first of all, to F, uh, uh, thank you. That, that was super uh, detailed and, and, and great. And Co coincidentally, m many of your points were made by the, by the referees, so we are actually working with that right now and I don't have an answer, okay. but I will in a month. So the levels of, use levels of carbon taxes instead of a dummy. I kind of prefer a dummy because then the coefficient is easier to, to, to interpret, but uh, you're absolutely right that these levels are very different. Uh, it also probably matters if, uh, you know, the level of a carbon tax is uh, $50 in 1990 versus $50 in 2015. So, so we are looking into this now, indeed. Uh, because that then will give an answer of 
for a country that now wants to impose a carbon tax, you know, what is the optimal carbon tax now if you want to have an effect? Um, what happens to interest rates? Uh, are firms issuing more bonds? Are there real effects? Are these firms trying to green up their technology, for example? Uh, we're looking into this right now. So, so yeah, thank you. That, that's obviously uh, super important to know as well. Um, what are the alternatives to a carbon tax in case a carbon tax is considered to be politically infeasible? Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, you know. <laughs> Bulgarian politicians, when they don't want to answer a question, they always say, I thank you for this question. This is a very interesting yeah. question. I was asked this question in a meeting last month, and we had a great discussion. What is your next question? So um, I, I don't know. I, I think there is no way around having a carbon tax. Um, and, and it's just that there has to be an international pressure, peer pressure, like with you know, the minimum corporate tax that after many, many, many years, and I think your country yeah. was against it for a long time, <laughs> yes. but then peer pressure takes its toll, and then everybody kind of, you, you, you look stupid if you're the only holdout. So, so I guess that's, that's the only way to, to go about it, that everyone else gangs up on, on the it last works, right? person, and it works. In the end, yeah. um, you had another question. Yes, yeah, so Benincasa et al., we, we cite them in our paper, and it's, it's also a great paper. And are the carbon taxes exogenous as well? Uh, should we look at the announcement date or, or the um, date in which it was voted or implemented? Um, so there doesn't seem to be a pre-trend before the implementation date, which means that if the announcement date was years ago, and I don't think you can take it as an announcement date. It's like, you know, government plans. Yeah. And you can always keep, kill it through lobbying. Yeah. Until, until it's signed into law, you don't know if this is going to become a law. Um, yeah. So, so I, think, uh, I think banks may likely be lobbying against it, and that's why they are unprepared, because they think they will defeat it. But, but, but we, can, we can look for when the tax was announced, indeed, and have an alternative test. Um, okay, so to the questions in the audience, um, does distance matter? We haven't looked into that. And bank regulation in home countries, uh, so we have home country time year fixed effect. So, so that is kind of taken care of. We have these banks that are lending to various countries abroad and the variation comes from whether the country you are lending to has or doesn't have. But whether, what, what kind of bank regulation you have at home and how that's changing over time, this we kind of control with these dummy interactions. So I would have to create a quadruple interaction in a way, and I'm not sure. Uh, but, but yeah, it's an interesting question, but econometrically I, I, it would be difficult to address right now. Uh, the implications of the taxonomy, um, I'm not a big fan of the taxonomy, I have to say. I, uh, I stand to be corrected, but I don't think it will, it will make a big difference. But, uh, if you look at, the, if you think about the definition of what we call fossil lending right now, it's coal, oil, and gas, right? The gas right now is considered uh, okay, -ish, right? Nuclear is fine, and I'm perfectly okay with this. Actually, nuclear should have never been treated as a, as a, you know, dirty way of generating energy, but but gas is borderline, and it's a political decision now that we will treat it as a transitional, transitionally okay fuel for a while. So. Um, so un until we have a more stringent taxonomy, then, then, you know, then I'll answer your question. Um, uh, is supervision a substitute? So that's, that's what our results kind of, kind of suggest. Maybe for that reason, that you know, now everybody's pressuring the banks into behaving in a good way. And probably the supervisor is also sending signals that some actions are now inconsistent with the will of the European voters, for example. So indeed, maybe having proper working supervision uh, may be a substitute for a carbon tax to an extent. It doesn't mean you shouldn't, you shouldn't do it. Um, and finally, the economic effect. The only thing we have is this aggregate calculation which gives you, globally speaking, a decline of 0.4% in fossil lending, which is really, really small. Uh, maybe I should attach an, an, an economic number to these to this coefficients that we have. But what we were after was this sort of the aggregate effect because, in, indeed, we wanted to think of it from the point of view of the planet. So let's think of it from the point of view of the planet. And from that point of view, it is really small decline. But you said it's a decline, so that's hopeful. So, hopeful. so let's, let's <laughs> um, take anything. <laughs> yes, we all will. Thank you very much.
Okay. So, thank you for being here, and thank you for inviting me here. Uh, yeah, I'm going to present my paper, Climate Risk Attention and Cryptocurrencies. You know, nowadays, climate change and cryptocurrencies are, the are at the core of the economic debate, and the two can be directly linked. And in particular, the bridge that links the two is based on the consensus mechanism through which uh, cryptocurrencies transactions are registered on the blockchain. Uh, in particular, we can define two mainly uh, cons consensus mechanisms. The first one is, is the proof of stake, uh, which is, let's say, the greener alternative. And the most spread one, and also the most polluting one, is the uh, proof of work. Um, well, the mining, um, we know that there are these miners that have to register the transactions, and in order to do that, they have to solve really hard puzzles, and in order to do that, they use really powerful machines. And of course, the more powerful the machines are, the more energy they require to work. And so here we have the climate uh, impact. And in particular, there is this paper by Goodkind uh, and others, 2020, that estimate that each dollar of Bitcoin value created accounts for $0.49 dollars in health and climate damage in the US and 0 0.37 in China. And of course, here we are just talking about Bitcoin, but there are more than 20K cryptocurrencies out there and the majority of them use proof of work uh, consensus mechanism. So here, th this is a, a graph of the proof of work mining activity. So let's suppose that uh, we have Ricardo and uh, Silvia, and Ricardo wants to pay uh, to Silvia one Bitcoin. This transaction is included in a block of transactions, and then this block of transactions need to be mined. And of course, what the miners have to do is to correctly guess what is the uh, input of the hash function such that the output of the hash function is lower or equal to a gamma t, which is called the hash target or network difficulty. And this is not an easy guess, of course. There are more than two trillions of possibility to guess the correct uh, uh, inputs. Uh, and the important thing is that the miners compete with each other because just the fastest win and uh, gets the fees plus the new coin that he has just mined. All the others are just polluters because they basically get nothing. So they just um, consume energy. It is kind of energy waste. Once the miners, I mean, once we have the fastest miners, the, fast, the fastest miner, the new block is added to the blockchain. Instead, this is proof of work. In a proof of stake, instead, we have not the miners' competition, but the miners are chosen by the system randomly. So, in a way, only the selected miners can mine, all the others cannot. So, there is no en energy waste, let's say. And furthermore, in a proof of stake, all the, supply is or, all the supply is already out. There is no need to solve puzzles because there is no need to extract new coin from the system. So in a way, it is more energy efficient. To have an idea about the, um, how much uh, crypto, proof of work crypto pollute, well, uh, those are data from 2021. And in particular, the annualized total Bitcoin footprints is uh, comparable to Kuwait, which is a, a country. Um, and if you look at the energy requirement by, uh, yes, the energy requirement of Bitcoin and Ethereum over the last of 2021, it is basically comparable to Italy energy consumption, Spain energy consumption, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, and a lot of other bigger countries. Um, instead, if you look at the single Bitcoin transaction, well, this is uh, comparable to more than 2 million of Visa uh, transactions. Okay? So those are huge numbers, and for this reason, I think that uh, you know, 
climate impact based on cryptocurrencies is something that we have to take into account. Uh, so what is the research question? Well, you know, uh, I'm f this could be the first paper in looking at this kind of stuff, and in particular, how climate risk affects the, the, the crypto return and if climate risk is priced in cryptocurrencies. Um, just to give you a flavor of the results, it seems that investors recognize crypto as a safe haven against the climate crisis. This could be counterintuitive, and indeed, this allows for the realization of a possible paradox that I called the crypto climate paradox, which we will see will be kind of a never ending loop, kind of a diabolic loop, I would say. Um, bit of literature. You know, there is this uh, new literature called the climate finance, and the GDO paper is among the, you know, the, the seminal paper. Uh, but then, I mean, my paper could fit the climate finance literature and also the, the, this literature, which is fastly growing, that is based on climate change and cryptos. I mean, just try to understand what is the relation between climate change and cryptocurrencies. Um, one of the most difficult things to do in, uh, in climate finance literature is to find a good measure for climate risk. Um, and uh, in order to do that, I exploit the variation in the attention toward climate risk, just like Engel and Gideo paper. And in particular, I proxy the attention through the daily Google search volume index, searching for climate change. This is an index that range from zero to 100. And to make it easy, it could be uh, taught as a kind of how many guys are searching on Google climate change in a certain geographic area and over a certain period of time. Um, and this could be a good measure of attention because, you know, you search on Google something because you are interested in it. Otherwise, why you have to search something on Google? Um, so once I have the proxy for the climate attention, then uh, I also collect data of the first 28 cryptocurrencies. Uh, I mean, I just take the prices in dollar. And so I have the sample period that goes from the end of April 2013 up to the end of June 2021. And of course, I exclude um, weekends and US holidays for mainly two reasons. The first one is that some data provider does not show weekend crypto returns data. For example, if you look on Bloomberg, you cannot find any uh, Saturday, Sunday uh, crypto prices. Um, and then the second reason is that some crypto exchange completes the trades only during the usual business days. In a way, if you want to uh, change 10 euros uh, Saturday from your bank account up to a crypto exchange website, you cannot do that. I mean, you can do the operation, but then this transaction will be completed during the usual business days. Um, and of course, the panel will be an unbalanced panel because, you know, different cryptos were born in different points in time. Um, this is the list of uh, crypto I used. Um, I also included the standard and poor's here just to have a comparison. Um, highly volatile, of course, but um, okay. So what's the empirical strategy? The empirical strategy is, I think, easy. Uh, the first hypothesis I check is whether climate attention is correlated with crypto uh, returns. Uh, and in order to do that, I estimate the fixed effect model in the equation one, where the dependent variable is the uh, return of coin i in day t. And it's calculated, I mean, as simple as that. So the price of today minus yesterday divided by yesterday. And then the independent variable is the daily variation of the Google search volume index searching for climate change. And then I have a series of controls. XIT represents the uh, coin size control, so it's the log market cap of coin I in the T, and ZT instead um, is the coin invariant controls, meaning the stock market fluctuations, so standard and poor's, and crypto investors' attention. Because there is this paper that say that, look, when um, crypto investors' attention is high, the return can be higher. So here I'm saying keeping constant the investor attention, let's see what is the impact of the climate attention on the crypto return. Then I have coin fixed effects and year fixed effects. 
uh, the result, I mean, the expectation at the beginning was like, well, I'm an investor, I know that crypto is gonna pollute, so I'm not buying crypto, so the price will fall down and also the returns. Instead, what I found is completely the opposite. So I found that there is a positive correlation between climate risk attention and cryptocurrencies return. Um, this could sound counterintuitive, but this could uh, corroborate the crypto safe haven literature. In particular, the idea is that um, I'm a crypto investor. Uh, when climate awareness is uh, more salient, we know that climate crisis may hit the banks and probably I'm going to shift my, my uh, investment on something that is completely decentralized. So even if all the banks will collapse, my investment in crypto is safe because crypto is a decentralized system. If we want to interpret the, uh, the magnitude, uh, I mean, 1% more of guys searching on Google climate change could lead, would lead to an increase of 0.4% in crypto returns. Um, and this is actually statistically significant, so um, could be scaring, I think, because um, this behavior, this investor's behavior in using crypto as a safe haven against the climate crisis would lead to the realization of this uh, crypto climate paradox, because actually we are saying that when we have a, a high uh, risk for climate crisis, then the investors refuge in crypto, but the, uh, the, this behavior here allow us to ask for more mining activity, and we know that the mining activity is gonna pollute, and so basically we are back here to, to generate a high climate crisis, I mean, to contribute to the climate crisis to happen. Um, this, as you can see, is a kind of a never-ending uh, cycle. Um, it could be um, not no more reliable if uh, the investors shift their attention on the proof of stake cryptocurrencies because we have seen that they are greener and are more energy efficient. Um, so the, the the question I ask is like, is this positive correlation driven by the greener cryptocurrencies rather than the proof of work cryptocurrencies? And in order to check that, I create this dummy green, which is equal to one in the case that the crypto in the sample is uh, proof of stake, otherwise it's zero. And I run the, equation, the regression of the equation number two, in which the coefficient of interest, of course, is the beta two coefficient, which say me, well, uh, what is the impact of the GSVI, so of the climate awareness on the returns of the green cryptocurrencies. And here the expectation was like, well, there is an increase in the price because everyone starts to, you know, um, be safe in crypto, but at the same time, they are not going to contribute to the climate, climate crisis to happen, and so they prefer the proof of stake rather than proof of work. Um, however, again, this is not um, happening. I mean, the beta two coefficient, as you can see, is statistically not different from zero in any specification, meaning that the investors are not able to uh, distinguish between the proof of stake or proof of work. I mean, they are kind of indifferent. And this could be a first sign of financial illiteracy uh, in the crypto market. As we probably know, the average investor in crypto is just like a guy that say, well, uh, there is a friend of mine that is making a lot of money investing in crypto, so I'm doing that. But they actually probably are not, they do not know what they're going to do. Um, these results here are just confirming the fact that, you know, the loop is there and, prob and the investors behave um, in a strange way because they are using cryptocurrencies to be safe against the climate crisis, but at the same time they are contributing to the crisis to happen. Um, just some robustness because, you know, there, both supply and demand can allow for higher crypto returns because this, from the supply side, the miners can decide to mine less. Um, I'm aware that I'm polluting, I'm a miner, and so I switch off some machines. I don't know why. Um, and the demand is that, is that investors buy more. And of course, the, the safe haven intuition works if the investors 
are driving, are driving the results. Um, and so the miners mine more. So the expectation following the safe haven intuition is that I will find a positive correlation between the climate risk awareness and the coin supply, and a positive correlation between climate risk awareness and the, uh, the crypto transactions. So in order to check that, um, I take the daily Bitcoin and Ethereum coin supply and the daily uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum transactions, and then I use as a supply controls the daily logarithm of the miners' revenue and the log of the daily mean hash power. Um, and then I start, start from the uh, supply side, and I found basically the positive correlation. So here I'm saying that when, there is a, when the climate awareness, risk awareness is more salient, the miners are mining more because the coin supply increase, so they are mining more. And this is basically followed by the fact that investors are investing more because the, 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 daily, the change in the daily transactions increase, meaning that there is a high number of transactions when the climate risk awareness is more salient. Um, and this, again, is going to make more robust the safe haven intuition and so the, uh, the crypto climate paradox. Um, this also interesting thing is based on the event study. I mean, I'm stressing the point that the investors are going to use crypto as a safe haven against the climate crisis. So the expectation, you know, what is the investor's reaction when climate catastrophes hit? Here the expectation is that after a flood or a hurricane, the, the crypto return should go up. I mean, because, uh, yeah, should go up. Um, and so I run this uh, event study in which the event window is in minus 20 plus 20 days. Uh, the event happened in zero. The lag i t plus j is the dummy indicating the period before the event. The, le the lead is another dummy indicating the period ahead, I mean, after the event. Um, and the results, again, are confirming the uh, safe haven mechanism and the, um, you know, the paradox. Because we see that in zero here and along all the day after, up to the 15th day for the floods and up to the 10th day for the hurricanes, there is this positive uh, trend um, uh, highlighting the fact, uh, uh, the baseline here is my, the, the average return of the five days before the event is going to hit. Um, so here this positive value means that with respect to the baseline, the returns are higher. Um, there are some statistically significant value also before the, the event is going to hit. But for floods, for example, there is kind of a sign alternation, so there is not clear positive trend as we see uh, during the event and after the events. And instead, for hurricane, first of all, we can say that there is some, um, you know, hurricane are predictable. So if you look at the news, uh, we already know when the hurricane is going to hit. But strongly, if you look at the magnitude of the coefficient, you see that during the event, the magnitude is almost the double. So some positive shock hit when the event hits. Um, the very last thing is instead based on the safe haven intuition. In particular, um, I find this positive correlation, and OK, it's fine. But what about if this positive effect is absorbed by other well-known source of risk? Because there are a lot of papers talking about safe haven mechanism of the, of the cryptocurrencies. Um, and so what about if my climate risk impact is not the climate risk impact, but is due to geopolitical risk or inflation risk or whatever other risk? And so in order to check this, I basically run this kind of three-factor risk models in which I consider the climate risk, the geopolitical risk, and the inflation risk. And uh, basically, I find that still the positive correlation is there. So the, the, the climate risk impact is not absorbed by all the others, by the other source of risk. So um, to, to, to conclude, I mean, this could be the first paper in um, analyzing this kind of behavior. Um, it seems that investors use cryptocurrencies as a safe haven 
against a possible climate crisis. At the same time, they are contributing to the crisis to happen, and this is explained by the crypto climate paradox. And so, what I mean, now we are living periods in which central banks, institutions are trying to um, regulate this uh, crypto phenomenon. And I think it must be fundamental to take into account the environmental impact that uh, these new instruments have on the, uh, on the society as a whole. And so it could be interesting to force the miner to publicly disclose their position and their emission and to impose to crypto creators more clarity about what they are going to offer. In a way, this could, you know, this could reduce the asymmetric information between the investors and the crypto market because I'm an investor. When I'm buying, uh, I don't know, a Bitcoin, I know how much uh, that Bitcoin is going to pollute, just as happens, I think, with the... Uh, uh, credit transact mastercard transaction i mean you after you pay you receive a message you pollute dot uh, uh, co2 emissions i mean this could be interesting um and so why not advertise more green cryptos and proof of stake consensus mechanism this could be a kind of green transition we are doing this with the cars right i mean we are shifting from diesel car up to electric vehicles why don't we do the same with uh, uh, the cryptocurrencies. I mean, Ethereum is already starting. Uh, I, mean, I think in September, yeah, this month, Ethereum will shift in a proof of stake. Why don't we fall, follow Ethereum always? So just shift toward proof of stake. Yeah, that's all. Good. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Attention. So the discussant is Silvia Lafontana. Ah, uh, Okay, scusa. Okay. No? Okay. <laughs> Hi everybody, thanks for inviting me to discuss this paper. I, I first met Carmine and knew about this paper a few months ago while at Imperial and I already saw many progresses in the paper, so I'm happy to see the paper keep going. Uh, okay, so let me start with just summarizing a little bit motivation and research question. So the, the motivation of the paper is quite straightforward. It starts from the idea that both cryptocurrencies and climate finance are at the core of the econ finance debate. And, uh, and, and it starts from the, the a strong fact that mining cryptos is actually a highly polluting activity. And I have to say that I wasn't aware of the of the current estimates that, the, that are in the paper that are very, very large. So there is this estimate about the $1 value of Bitcoin that is supposed to generate half dollar value, uh, half dollar of health damage in the US. Uh, there are other uh, data that Carmine showed that suggests that there's it, it's a very, it's a highly polluting uh, activity. So the question, the research question I think is quite uh, relevant is like, do cryptocurrencies returns price uh, climate risk? And so what the paper does is analyzing the relation between an index that proxies climate attention with cryptocurrencies return. And the main hypothesis is that mining crypto uh, is a highly polluting activity, so more demand for cryptos induces more pollution. So what we expect is that when climate risk awareness is higher, uh, crypto returns should be lower. And actually the results suggest that the correlation is positive. So they're counterintuitive, it's happening the, the opposite. So more awareness of, uh, of climate risk uh, means higher demand for cryptocurrencies uh, trading. Uh, and I think the, the, the results are very interesting uh, and they are potentially relevant for the climate finance literature uh, because they can tell us something about like how investors behave around like these uh, indexes uh, of climate change awareness, how do they respond to that? Um, and we know from the, from the climate finance literature that returns of brown stocks are negatively correlated with index of, of climate attentions or with climate disasters, uh, increase in carbon taxes, 
So the question is now, like, why are crypto traders behaving differently? And like, besides some other comments that I can discuss directly with Carmine, I will spend the next uh, few minutes to try to, to, to understand this, because I think this is what is probably um, still uh, missing in the paper, is really trying to understand, like, what is the mechanism at play and why do we see this positive correlation? What, what is the reason behind this? Um, so again, like why returns of a, if we consider now cryptos, you convince me enough that they are highly polluting assets. So if I, if I see crypto as a highly polluting asset, why does this positively correlate to an index for, for climate attention? And uh, yeah, the, in the paper, the, the paper concludes that cryptos behave like safe haven assets, but we need to like more tests to understand like the, the channel at play. So the first uh, potential explanation that I think you also point at the conclusion of your paper is, and you also like mentioned in the presentation, is that crypto investors are not aware of pollution caused by mining activities. Um, I'm not sure this is what is uh, happening. Uh, and I, I, the reason is that if I think if we blame financial literacy, uh, then I don't know why we should expect any correlation at all or the positive correlation. But anyway, I think this is a fair point that can be tested and maybe there is some variation in the time series that can be uh, exploited. Uh, I was just you know, Googling like these articles in the past week and it seems that there's much more articles pointing to how much cryptos are polluting in recent times. So uh, this one actually went out yesterday and uh, what they're saying here is that energy consumption uh, has been an issue for Bitcoin for a few years now, but this summer a Chinese court ruled that Bitcoin was bad for the environment. So probably there are some events that can be used to see whether, like in recent uh, times, maybe this correlation is lower or maybe it even reverse uh, the sign. And then the, the second question that comes to my mind is like, is this crypto specific? So again, if, if this is the only polluting asset that, that behaves in this way, uh, why is that? What makes it different from the others? And I was thinking about it when you also showed the test on green cryptos versus the other cryptos. And something that I was, that I was thinking is, you know, maybe we tend to have like, climate awareness and care about climate change in the same bucket, but somehow it could be that they're not exactly the same thing. Like there can be investors that are climate aware, but they don't really care about climate change as long as they, this doesn't affect their portfolio investments. So if I think about cryptos and climate risk related to that, I guess like when we think about physical versus transition risk, I guess what we're thinking about here now is the transition risk. So uh, change in regulations, uh, change in carbon prices. Uh, and so I wonder, like, do maybe investors believe that cryptos can be less affected by regulatory changes? Uh, so I, I wonder, like, uh, I don't know, like, what does the mining happen? Uh, are miners obliged to report where they do these transactions and how much they pollute? And, and, and the question, and which I think is even more uh, relevant after the last presentation, is like, can miners move easily to other countries? So maybe like there is this transition risk is perceived as lower just because it's a more opaque activity that can easily find a way through like uh, escaping to other countries or, or, or uh, being yeah, less affected by, by these uh, shocks. And then the paper concludes that, uh, yeah, that, that, that this correlation suggests cryptos is like a safe haven for climate risk. And there is this test including GDP, geopolitical risk, and it shows that the, re the result remains strong for climate saliency. So I guess like, uh, what, like understanding what happens when we include actually other safe haven assets in the test, uh, how does cryptocurrencies if they are indeed a safe haven for climate, um, how do they correlate with respect to like yields of green bonds, uh, returns of clean tech stocks, and other assets that we consider uh, safe haven assets? And then one last uh, suggestion I have is that maybe uh, 
and, and this is again like to try to understand like the mechanism and, and what what is driving this this positive correlation. Uh, maybe besides like just the climate attention index and the Google search volume index, we might try to understand like how crypto's returns respond to other measures of climate risk. So we have, for example. Uh, Green innovation intensity is a measure that I don't see used very often. It is, it is available at the OECD website. Uh, there are, of course, like carbon taxes. Uh, other papers show like uh, how investors respond to uh, elections and, and so on. So to conclude, uh, I think the paper documents, uh, well, the paper documents a puzzling fact, and there is this positive correlation between climate change awareness and a highly polluting asset. Uh, and I think more tests to try to understand the economic uh, mechanism are needed and they would actually be very interesting. So the main question to me remi remain, why are investors buying crypto where, when climate awareness is higher? Uh, and then potentially this, this maybe could be generalizable to other polluting assets or whether it is crypto specific still relevant. Uh, so I think the initial results in the paper are interesting and yeah, understanding the uh, mechanism at play would increase the potential contribution of this study in the climate finance literature. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm collecting questions. Okay. Is there any question? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentations. And, and just a brief uh, question because I was just wondering how... Uh, how you uh, separate the trend of climate change and the trend of, of cryptos. I mean, uh, you use um, uh, the search uh, of climate change on Google, but uh, we know that climate change has increased its importance uh, during the last years. So how do you separate uh, climate change trend from the crypto trend? and climate change join crypto. I mean, uh, I don't know if this climate attention index uh, could separate uh, both or if you apply some adjustment uh, to separate just the climate change attention independent, independent uh, from the crypto uh, trend. Thank you. Yeah, I have a similar question, I think. Uh, you know, you're using, you have monthly data, if I understand well. Daily data. Daily, and the return are calculated daily or monthly? Daily. And you're using year fixed effect. Yeah, I should. Uh, yeah. You know, okay. but okay. this means that, you know, at least uh, you need to take into consideration mm -hmm. autocorrelation of the return of your dependent variable and also all the issues regarding the classical return, you know. Um, volatility and, and et cetera. But uh, yeah, so please. Okay, um, so thank you, Silvia, for the amazing discussion. Um, first, the question you, yeah. Okay, the first one is about uh, why do the investors have to uh, choose uh, cryptos as a safe haven? Well, the idea I had, but still I need to test this, is that you know, um, as I said before, we know that crypto is a decentralized option and we know that the climate crisis can hit the banks in a severe way. And so as investor, I would be safe in a case the bank could collapse. And so basically I shift my intention and my attention towards the crypto as a safe haven because it is decentralized. Uh, this, this can be a mechanism. Uh, how can I check this? I'm still thinking about it. Um, I mean, work, working with crypto is not as easy as it can seem. Um, yeah, there is nothing out there. Uh, you have to search data in websites that are not official, and then you don't know if that data are good or not good. Uh, so it's quite, uh, it's quite a difficult thing. Um, so I will, I will think about this. Um, use the other climate risk indicator like uh, green uh, uh, innovation in, on intensity. That one, by the way, um, is a good idea. I will do that. Um, then, about the regulatory changing. Well, you know, the miners, uh, we don't know where they are actually. Um, they are like ghosts. So 
It's like they have this big farm uh, in which they mine. They have a lot of machines inside. They turn on these machines 24 hours a day, but you don't know where they are located. So um, even if there would be a, um, a regulation based on the mining activity, uh, you first have to identify where they are and then you can target them. Because, I mean, I can say that you are a miner, but actually you're not. So how can I identify a miner? I, can, I, I have to go there physically and look at the farm. If there are a lot of machines working, then I know that you're a miner. So otherwise, I, I, I cannot know that um, a priori. Um, okay. About the trends, um, I agree with you. Uh, indeed, I'm working on another uh, version based on um, not year fixed effect, but on six months fixed effect. Um, and then another one on uh, a quarter fixed effect. Just, you know, I'm squeezing the... Uh, yeah, but then I, I, I'm losing a lot of variation then. Yeah, yeah, no, I completely agree. Indeed, I'm fighting with myself about finding a solution to this, but uh, I know it's quite complicated, yes.